Good evening, everyone. Here, Imran Abbas. Uh, again, we are live. I am live from Dubai, and today I am with the Professor Amir Khan. Uh, Professor Amir Khan is the educational director of uh, Global Laparoscopy and Robotics. Uh, all of our academic activities is under supervision of Professor, with guidance of Professor. We are going ahead slowly, slowly, and uh, definite. Uh, we will try our best uh, to contribute uh, our knowledge, uh, share uh, sharing knowledge and facilitate uh, our youngsters, uh, especially to learn more from those who are expert in bariatric surgery and minimal invasive surgery. And luckily it is great honor for myself uh, to interview such a great personality. Sir, really so much thanks. It's great honor for me, sir. Thank you, Imran. Thank you very much. It's real pleasure. And I must say the service you've done on this channel has been great because uh, you've done already sessions on uh, milligastric bypass, OAGB, as well as sleeve. And this is now RYGBs. And uh, I've listened to most of the interviews which have been done. And you've covered fantastic because you've got a lot of experts on the subject who have been talking about what are the way forward and how the journey was. I think. Uh, I'm really thankful to you to give me an opportunity to come and talk about my experience, what I've learned over the years, and how I can help the juniors to establish their services. Sir, really so much thanks. And because as you know better than me, because all of these questions and all of these sessions uh, is definite uh, under your supervision. Sometime when we will see a, a documentary or film so you will see some artist, but someone is behind the curtain and uh, who are the brain and definite uh, without your support, uh, these uh, uh, interview series and all of our academic activities was not possible. And this is reality. Sir, we have, uh, uh, as you know, so our questions uh, will be in different session. Uh, personally, definite, I know, but uh, we also, uh, we are, uh, interested to hear from your side, your brief introduction, your journey of bariatric surgery, especially ruined by gastric bypass. Yeah, Imran, I started bariatric surgery as a youngster and uh, it's been uh, quite a long time ago. It's a part of the previous century. I think my most of my bariatric training was between 86 and 90. Oh my God. Uh, those are the years when I did most of my training. Uh, when, when I started, bariatric surgery was very much in infancy. And uh, at that time, you remember the word was a bariatric, uh, bar, that the treatment of weight, which gradually changed to metabolic surgery, because as we did more and more research on it, we found the benefits uh, to uh, its beneficial effects on metabolic uh, disease itself. Uh, when I started training, and uh, then in about early 90s, when I became a consultant, mm -hmm. Uh, my initial operations were uh, vertical banded gastroplasty. Uh, we used to do a salastic ring gastroplasty. It was all open surgery at the time. And uh, then from there, I moved on to JI bypasses, jejunal ideal bypasses, and then gradually moved on to gastric bypasses. The gastric bypass, originally we used to do transverse incision and transverse uh, division of the stomach and then put a bypass on that. But then gradually we moved on to the present form of a gastric bypass. Most of my work in the early days was all open surgery. Uh, and it used to be quite uh, challenging surgery because in open with the big patients, I remember, I think the highest one I did at that time was in open was uh, 300 kilograms uh, oh patient. Uh, so we had a specially built table for it. And we also had to go out and get straps uh, to put the patient in position so the patient doesn't slip on the table. So it was, it was, those days were not easy. And when we did open surgery, initially we didn't choose to divide the stomach. We used to just staple it across with the four rows of staple uh, and a special clamp for it, uh, TA B90 and TA90 uh, clamps for it, uh, BN90. So that was one with the notch, which was used for a gastroplasty and the one without a notch was used for a gastric bypass. Uh, then uh, from there, I in early the mid 90s, about 94, 95, I think 95, when I started learning about the lap bands, 
I remember going to Belgium to learn uh, uh, with Balashev, learned the ba gastric bands, then came and did some gastric bands. Then we thought if we could do gastric bands, why can't we do other surgeries laparoscopically as well, uh, bariatric surgery? I remember once sitting at Alan Core uh, lab in uh, Paris and spent whole day trying to make a gastric pouch. And when I opened the pig, my pouch was the size of a stomach, basically, rather than a proper pouch. So it was challenging because instrumentation was in its pri uh, pri uh, uh, was very primitive at that stage. Uh, so we gradually, from uh, uh, band, moved on to laparoscopic gastroplasties because we had a special gun for it. We started make, doing laparoscopic gastroplasties, and then gradually. Almost in, after the turn of the century, uh, in the middle, we started doing uh, uh, laparoscopic bypasses. So it's been a journey all across uh, from open surgery towards laparoscopic surgery, because uh, the laparoscopic surgery, to be honest, has got huge advantages, because the access to that part of the stomach at the top wasn't easy. I remember those, we, should, we had all sorts of retractors, but it wasn't very easy. The best retractor which helped me was a Rochard retractor, which we used to put on the sternal border and lift the sternum up with that. I had a special bars made for that. Uh, so I think those were the days uh, when it wasn't that easy, but we managed to do it. We had good results. And then laparoscopic surgery, when it took on and instrumentation got better, that's how we moved on to the present form of ruin wire gastric bypass. Uh, RYGB has been a uh, basic, uh, I think, gold standard operation uh, for a long time now, from 80s onwards, it's been a gold standard operation. And uh, initially it was done transversely and then went on to the vertical pouch. Lots of discussion on pouch sizes, as well as how do you make the stomas and uh, how do we change uh, our uh, length of the bowel. Uh, so we went through that journey initially, I used to do retrocolic. Then I found in retrocolic, there were more problems, especially with internal hernias. So I moved on to the anticolic and then standard has been anticolic. And since laparoscopic, I always do anticolic. Initial stages I used to use, uh, I've been through different ways of uh, anastomosis. I used uh, hand anastomosis with interrupted sutures. I've also done, uh, a circular stapler with 25 staple, then Orville, because you remember the present form of Orville. Before that, what we used to do was to break the lock. Yeah, I remember. Gun, yeah. Right, and attach it to a nasogastric tube to make yeah, an yeah. Orville. Yeah. So we used to do that. And then I moved on to, now my present form is that I use uh, vertical stapler, uh, 45, and then do an anterior layer with my hand anastomosis uh, suturing. So that's been a journey which I've gone on. I've still got uh, the, I tell you for weight loss point of view, the best operation was the jejunoideal bypass. And uh, the only problem was the metabolic problems afterwards. Uh, the patients used to get a lot of biochemical uh, disturbances and we used to have to give them cocktails, which we had made in our department. Uh, I've still got actually a couple of patients who refuse to have it reversed. I've reversed all the others and then given them a gastric bypasses. So I think uh, it's evolution of bariatric surgery. I've seen it, how it's changed over the years. And I'm one of those that I don't think we've come to an end of it uh, because there's still, I think, going to be a lot of development and youngsters like you are going to bring new operations. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, and I'm, I'm always there to learn. I've, I've changed myself from where I was 30 years ago to what I do today. Uh, I think I've learned over the year. And recently, I'll talk about it a bit later on that since I've started doing mini bypass as well, uh, I've learned that uh, the metabolic part is very important. So BP limb is very important. We'll have a discussion on that later on. Sir, excellent, sir. Definite, it is great honor for myself and also for my viewers. Today, we are hearing from someone who has experience of bariatric surgery more than three decades. And definitely uh, this session will be one of the best session. Uh, so definitely we are talking with someone just, uh, he's, uh, he is a pioneer of uh, bariatric surgery. He started bariatric surgery with open and now 
uh, with this uh, time of robot and advanced laparoscopy sir because our viewers are also youngsters and our target is also convey our message about bariatric surgery to someone who are just now going to start bariatric surgery or at initial stage of bariatric surgery we have divided these questions in three steps basic questions some pre op so technical points and then we will talk about post op so one thing that is the most important in my opinion because our uh, youngster we our target is to convey our message to youngster what is the uh, minimum setup for bariatric surgery if someone is going to start and must do this then must go for surgery bariatric yeah i think that's a very important uh, uh, question you've asked and i think this uh, interestingly when i started in those days no one wanted to come near bariatric because with open surgery it wasn't a fun Uh, and in those days, I remember I used to run around single-handedly, and that wasn't the time. I don't want anyone to do that. I think there is a minimum requirement of a team. The team there is a team which is for patient care pre-op, and then there's a team at the time for operation and the team post-operatively. Right? The minimum requirement I think for a team is a surgeon, a good anesthetist. You need an endocrinologist. You need a specialist nurse. i tell you specialist nurse makes your life easy without that it's a hell and then you need a very good dietitian and you need a bariatric psychologist as well ordinary dietitians do not understand bariatrics so you need a specially trained bariatric dietitian right and i think that is the minimum team you require and then you need a very good team in theaters and you need a very good team uh, in the wards to look after these patients i tell you there's a big difference i do simple things like even hernias or laparoscopies it's more difficult to mobilize those patients whereas the bariatric patients by the time you finish theater less you come to the ward the patients are walking around and that is the preparation of those patients and it's the team which does it the team is important otherwise as a single handed surgeon if you try to do this all work yourself one you would be giving a not uh, optimum service to your patients it will be below standards and secondly you will not be able to carry on with the work what you want to do for your patients you need this team a minimum team to set up bariatric surgery then you also need a special equipment for it in early days we used to we uh, put hoist in our wards so we had a ward which specially made for that we also had hoist in theater because some of these patients uh, your staff can't lift them out of bed because yes when you bring the patient on the table they walk in and they sit on a lie on the table but when you want to get them off the table you need to people to lift them off so for that we had a hoist now you got this hover mattresses and all those so that is a development further so i think you need a right equipment you need the right team before you start this surgery it is not an easy surgery to embark on and then again in post operative pay period you need the same team to look after these patients you cannot manage everything yourself surgeon is just a part of the team you may call him as a leader or want to lead the team but he cannot do this all on his own sir so much thanks really and because nowadays unfortunately this these videos and youtube they misguide our youngsters and they just think so this is some stippling and i can do and this is nothing and and then unfortunately they 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 face many troubles so they must know about this so bariatric surgery is no not just some stippling and stipplers so preparation of the patient pre op post op care everything is important yeah and i think it is very important because if you see that uh, your team actually prepares the patient for surgery because surgery is a very small part yeah it takes about an hour and a half to 2 hours to do the operation but it is the care of the patient afterwards and before the dietary modification it's a complete change of life so i think you need to prepare the patient it got to be the right patient for it so my thanks sir really thank you sir so now we will talk some about ron my gastric bypass according to your experience we know about the guidelines but your experience and your protocol what is the relative and absolute contraindication of ron my gastric bypass uh i think uh, 
there are relative and absolute contraindications, but I think generally my uh, my still preference is to invite gastric bypass. Right, that's my first option. Okay, so I look at the patient with a view whether I can do that or for uh, for them or not. There are technical reasons sometimes you can't do it. A patient who has got a hostile abdomen, it's difficult. A person who suffers from inflammatory bowel disease, I, I won't offer them ruined by gastric bypass. Uh, someone who's had a previous uh, lap, multiple laparotomies, I think I'd have, I would offer them ruined by gastric bypass. Uh, there is a relative contraindication is smokers, because I think my experience, which I learned the hard way, smokers develop ulcers. Yeah. Uh, it's very important that you got to convince your patients to stop smoking beforehand, if you can convince them. Uh, other than that, I think it's more technical uh, contraindications than actually contraindications from uh, a clinical point of view uh, for ruined by gastric bypass. Uh, as long as patient needs meets the requirements, uh, guidelines laid down by uh, NICE and uh, if so, and they fulfill that requirement, then I think you need to sit down the patient. You need to look at your own expertise, right? And technically, like if it's a super obese patient, rather than me struggling with a mini bypass, uh, with a ruined by gastric bypass, I would rather go and do a sleeve first because that patient might require a second operation later on. So I can, so I think it's more relative rather than an absolute contraindications. So much thanks. Sir, regarding uh, post-menopause uh, female patients, if the patient is suffering with the osteoporosis and symptomatic osteoporosis, because as we know, yes, sir, one way gastric bypass is a restrictive procedure, but again, there is some hypoabsorptive component. And also we, we face a vitamin D deficiency, calcium, and maybe this osteoporosis will uh, aggravate after this. So have you any protocol for such a case? No, what we do is that uh, if you look around, which I think most of us have all come across it and you've seen it yourself, that patients who are um, morbid obese, they already lack essential elements, right? So whenever you test their blood, most of them are going to be vitamin D deficient and most of them are going to be deficient in other essential elements. So what we do is we try to correct them beforehand and uh, although if you see uh, your bypass is supposed to be restrictive, but it has got a malabsorptive element to it, uh, whereas your sleeve, although it's a restrictive, but it has also got a metabolic effect with it. So I think we give all our patients get substitutes for vitamin D and uh, calcium. Uh, I've not seen uh, hypertoxicity with that at present uh, till today. So we will prescribe them all. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think I don't think that is a contraindication that someone who's got osteoporosis you don't offer them. But you need to correct it and make sure they stay on medication afterwards. So now, what's my question, sir? So if someone is suffering with the osteoporosis and there is symptomatic osteoporosis, it is compulsory to treat this osteoporosis yes. before going down. Okay. I would treat it before I go in. Yeah. And that's yeah. the reason why I said in the beginning that more very important part of your team member is uh, uh, is an endocrinologist as well. Yeah. Because uh, I've got, I'm, I'm very lucky, I've got Dr. Andrew Hartland with me, who is a very good endoc endocrinologist. And he and the dietitian get all those things right before I embark onto these patients. Yes, I think you should correct those. Because sir, this is a great message from your side. So no need to rush for surgery, just prepare the patient because then you will face more complication. Yes. And also, I think under any circumstance, there are no circumstances in which you should rush this surgery yeah. because it's a change of a lifestyle completely. Yeah. So I think you need to prepare the patient mentally before they get to that stage. Definitely, sir. Sir, according to your experience, have you any limitation, age limitation, like adolescents or older age? When I started, we used to say between 16 to 60. But yeah. now... With the life expectancy gone up to 85, 86, I think we've gone up even to up to 70 now. So there isn't, on the upper side, I haven't got that much age limitation. It depends on the uh, uh, patient's physiological state rather than numerical number. Whereas, as far as the children are concerned, I am reluctant. I tell you, I'm still reluctant to children because the reason is that they don't understand what's involved in it. 
So I think that is an area where I am still reluctant. I do not offer them surgery easily now. So from which uh, age you prefer? So 30 plus? Uh, uh, after, I think after 18. After 18, okay. After yeah. 18. Uh, so have you any experience? You did surgery now 20 years ago. You did this on my gastric bypass and you're following your patient. My, my youngest one is 14 years old, which I did a long time ago. And uh, I think I, won't, I, won't, uh, I would be reluctant to offer uh, to people at that age uh, ruined by gastric bypass. Okay, sir. Sir, regarding uh, pre op endoscopy and H. pylori eradication, what is your personal protocol? What are you doing? Uh, I don't do it. Never done it. Uh, endoscopy, I only do in patients who are symptomatic. Okay. If someone in terms of reflux, I would get an endoscopy done. Uh, otherwise, I don't. Uh, and I've, to be honest with you, I have not, it's not a routine that we do H. pylori eradication. If we know about someone, yes, we'll do it. Otherwise, not. No, this is not compulsory and there is no, according to your, yes, this is just your experience. There might be people who yeah, differ yeah. with me, disagree with Definitely, definite, sir. Sir, so now we will talk a little about technical points. Uh, definite during this journey of bariatric surgery and especially ruin by gastric bypass, as you have mentioned earlier also. So this is the evolution of, uh, gradually evolution of uh, ruin by gastric bypass. And you see everything. So length of pouch, size of gastro, jejunostomy, BP limb, everything. We are interested to hear from your side some technical points that you change progressively. And now you have standardized your technique as, and why you have changed for better results. Yeah. I think, again, as I said earlier, was that this has been a learning uh, process, to be honest. With you. And I'm, I'm one of those I believe that the day I stop learning, I'll stop practicing uh, because I think we learn every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we with uh, when we did transverse incisions, the pouches used to be very big, and we realized how quickly they stretch, and the patients uh, were not losing weight, right? And uh, when we went on to the vertical pouch, uh, in, I think my standard pouch now is between 30 to 50 mils. I used uh, I use a bougie to make a pouch around it, okay? And same is my anastomosis. I use. Uh, uh, 45 GIA as well as anterior two layer uh, as, uh, the, the, uh, the PDS or micro with a hand sewn. Uh, with that anastomosis is about a centimeter diameter sort of an uh, with a uh, with a diameter. But I don't put a tube in it to measure it. Right. Uh, I think that gives enough restriction. Uh, one of the things which I have changed quite uh, quite early in my career was change from retrocolic to anticolic. Uh, because I think retrocolic causes more problems uh, because of the chances of uh, herniation is much higher in retrocolic, whereas anticolic herniation chances are small. But even if a hernia happens, it's got such a wide uh, space that you don't, don't see strangulation. Yeah. So that is that. And technically, it's easier as well, uh, anticolic. So that has been another change. My standard uh, length, uh, the pouch size between 30 to 50, uh, and uh, my limb size, the standard ones, is 75 centimeter from a DJ flexure for a biliary limb, and elementary limb is about 100 centimeters. But then I do change it according to patient's BMI. It's very interesting. A recent change which I made is, and that is because I've, since I've started doing mini bypass as well, I've learned BP limb is the most important part. Yeah. And I've started lengthening BP limb in patients who are bigger and bigger, like someone with a BMI of above 50, I would lengthen the size of the BP limb. Elementary limb, to be honest, doesn't matter. I think that will still stay at 100 centimeters. But the BP limb, I have changed the length of that now. Sir, regarding BP limb, because as you have already mentioned, so this, I don't think next decade also we can standardize this BP limb because there are different ethnicities and also different dietary protocols so it is much difficult to standardize at the globe for all of uh, uh, so people or patients. So, so that is my question. So yes, you are practicing in UK and uh, definite 80% of your patients are same ethnicity, same dietary habits. 
So what is your standard to select BP limb, BMI, age of the patient, gender of the patient, and comorbidities? So if this is, can you explain about this? I think first thing is the BMI. If a patient is super obese, I would give them a longer BP limb. Right. Whereas if a patient has got a BMI of up to 40, 45, I would still keep a BP limb of 75 centimeters because that's my standard. The reason I just, just before I move on further was one of the advantages of standardization is that when you are trying to train people, because we are a training center, we can all, it's easier to train them with standardization rather than trying to give them variations of different things of different timings. So what, because most of our trainees, when they are working, they work on people with a BMI of under 50. So we try to, are, that's a standard you've got 75 by 100 centimeters. And that has evolved over the years where we have been reasonable results with that one and we stick to that. Whereas if the patients with a super breeze, I think the BP limb should be lengthened for that, right? And uh, nowadays, I'm also looking at uh, this recently starting that instead of, because I used to have my uh, standard uh, pouch would start at second branch uh, on the lesser curve. Yes. Right? Mean. That was fought for measuring that it will still stay 30 to 50 mils pouch. But now I've started lengthening a little bit, right? And uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's important is the quality of life for the patients. So I think you might have to make some adjustments because of the quality of life for the patient and work out the right operation for the right patient. Sir, excellent. Sir, if a patient is suffering with the hiatal hernia, uh, so definitely you will go for a Rowan gastric bypass. Are you prefer to repair uh, this hiatus, hiatoplasty? If it is uh, more than two centimeter hiatus hernia, I would repair it. If it's a very small height of hernia with just a dimple, which you feel when you put your forcep onto that and patient is not symptomatic, then I won't repair it. I will just do a Ruan bygastric bypass because Ruan bygastric bypass itself is an anti reflux procedure. Uh, so I think uh, that does sort the problem out. But if it is uh, uh, height of hernia, which is symptomatic and it's more than two centimeters, I do a posterior repair, a proper posterior repair. I'll go in repair the cruras and then do a bypass. Sir, uh, definitely you have a, a large experience and wide experience about uh, this in more than three decades. So have you, are you remember, so there was a large size of uh, hiatal hernia and uh, you don't repair that and you did surgery and there was no issue after surgery and patient was happy. I think uh, it's the problem is that people with sliding hiatal hernia, there's always been a worry because you don't want your pouch to go back up, right, with a small bowel. Whereas uh, people who don't have a uh, large hernias, you can get away. Yes, in good old days, we have done cases where we have got away without repairing hiatal hernias. Uh, but uh, those patients don't do as well afterwards. I think if you repair it, they do much better. It's good. And that has been an anecdotal thing rather than I haven't done any scientific study on it. Sir, another thing, so definitely when there is a large size hiatal hernia and we also do hiatoplasty, again, there is chance of migration of this gastric pouch to mediastinum. So are you agree to do any gastropexy with the crura or with the remnant? Uh, so because this interview series also personally, I learned a lot. So this was my question from uh, Professor uh, Bruno Dilemann. And yeah. routinely he do uh, this gastropexy, this pouch with remnant. And as he mentioned, and he asked, so this is a good experience. So always he do this. And then now there is no migration of this gastric pouch in mediastinum. Uh, Imran, to be honest with you, I have, no, I have no experience of that. And over the years, I've not had any need to do it. And I have... Uh, with, uh, if I look, think back, I haven't had a pouch migration. So I think there is a lot I've read in literature, I've, I've heard about uh, my colleagues who are very keen in uh, those procedures. But to be honest with you, I have not needed it over the years. 
So it might be the type of patients I'm dealing with, someone who's got a very large height of hernia, normally I've entertained them for a bariatric surgery, uh, but uh, I have not experienced this, no. Okay, sir. So another nightmare of a surgeon and also patient is internal hernia. After oh, yes. gastric bypass, uh, so are you close defects? Yeah, that's, I, I knew you were going to ask me this question because we've had this debate a long time. <laughs> but I don't close, right? And uh, I have actually uh, done a study. We looked at uh, 100 patients, uh, which uh, one of my uh, junior colleagues did that, and went back, look at our 10 years period. We did a telephone survey as well as postal survey on those patients and tried to find out how many of them presented with uh, internal hernias. Uh, it was less than 2%. So if I read the literature rightly or wrongly, in literature, if you look around that people who close hernial spaces, they still report between 2 to 4% uh, high, uh, internal hernias. So I'm, I'm not sure. So excellent. Sir, in Britain, yeah, please. Uh, internal hernias more when we did retrocolic. Retrocolic. But yeah. now, what, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we are talking because as, a, as you know, so this retrocolic space is a real Peterson space. That anticolic, that is a pseudo Peterson, that is not the real. So we are talking now about anticolic. So because most of surgeons now, they follow this technique because this interview series is just, uh, so this is a message. Uh, so sharing knowledge. So if someone has with experience of more than three decades and now not repairing this uh, uh, defects and so definitely we love, we respect our patients. We are scientists, we are realistic. So in my opinion, this is a great message. And I also, I also know some other ones also, they don't repair. Sir, what is my question? During this journey of bariatric surgery, definite you have faced internal hernia of your own patients, have you yes. faced any gangrene of intestine? I, I haven't, uh, not myself, I haven't seen the gangrene, but I used to get more trouble when I did retrocolic. Yeah. Right? That was one of the reasons why I've changed from retrocolic to anticolic, because in retrocolic, they actually present very, uh, with severe pain and signs of uh, gangrene. I had, I've seen one, uh, quite recently, and this was from a patient where they actually closed all the holes. Yeah. And he came in uh, with, uh, it wasn't gangrene, but it was, at, I think it came in time. By the time we got in, the bowel was looking ischemic, but we got away by just uh, untwisting the whole thing. So why are you asking this? So when we close, if we go to close, so then if we must close properly, yes. If there will be a defect that is more dangerous as compared to open, then open is better. If you have not expertise, if you cannot close properly, please don't close. If you want to close, then follow proper that standard, how you close and complete close. If there will be partial close, that is more dangerous. And I think it's very important if you want to close it, close it with a non-absorbable material. Yeah. Because Remember, when, when these patients lose weight, everything becomes uh, lax. Yes. And that's developed internal hernias. Yeah. And not, not in early stages. Yeah. Uh, so I, you need to be very careful and make sure you close it properly. And as Imran, you said, make sure you close it properly with a non absorbable material and uh, not just say, I've closed it and that's it. No, yeah. do it properly. Yeah. So my thanks, sir. sir. Now we will talk a little about some post op. Uh, so what is your protocol? Uh, any protocol of post-op endoscopy? Your... Uh, we don't do routinely. Yes. We only do it on symptomatic patients. Uh, if patient has got uh, reflux or ulcer or pain, yes, they have an endoscopy. But we don't do it routinely. Because look, I work in NHS and uh, we have got pressure of work and we try to do uh, what is essential rather than everything which we can. We need the ideal world. Yes, we should do it, but we don't do it. Uh, sir, definitely. So, but uh, so have you any data which percentage of your patients after one way gastric bypass are symptomatic? 
uh, from uh, reflux or uh, you said about symptomatic uh, pain and that was necessary to go for endoscopy i think about between 5 to 10% 5 to 10% you are symptomatic and uh, what was the common finding in such a patients i've uh, i found mostly ulcerations the pain the commonest cause in the pain is an ulceration we used to see it more when we did open surgery because in open surgery we didn't use to divide the stomach we used to use the four rows of staple and the stomach was still intact so they used to develop gastrogastric fistula yeah and before that they were developing ulcers uh, and asthmatic ulcers the other group which i've seen problems is the ones who are smokers they develop an asthmatic ulcers in early stages if you're going to get an ulcer it's usually an ischemic ulcer if it's in early stages and that's technical reasons uh, so i think uh, uh, overall if uh, between five, and if you if you work for long enough as i have and live in the same part of the world you are going to get your own patients coming back to you yeah this reason is not pain or symptom is mostly the weight regain yeah so so definitely sir in run way gastric bypass uh, this ulcer or marginal ulcer is acid base ulcer and also already you have mentioned so most of our, these patient that 5 to 10% were suffering with the uh, marginal ulcer or symptomatic or gerd uh, so if we compare if we see if we see the data or just imagine how many patient were smoker how were how many patients were using nsaids and when you do endoscopy in these cases a definite uh, endoscopist also check h pylori have we yeah. any data to see so in these patients how much were h pylori positive how much were using nsaids i don't have it off hand but i think this is a, you've given me a good idea i could ask my uh, trainees to look into that one this will be good data so especially for our youngsters so if we see so if there is 30 to 50% are h pylori positive then we may be a little more uh, 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 conscious for h pylori before surgery uh, so maybe this is the cause and uh, sir okay sir next so uh, again another thing that already we have talked about marginal ulcer and you have mentioned uh, so what is your protocol for ppi after uh, uh, rohanvai gastric how long time you suggest your patients to use ppi 6 months 6 months and that is anecdotal there's no scientific reason for that because i think after 6 months most of the patients settle down and uh, the ones who are who develop symptoms of gerd or reflux afterwards you put them back on again but majority of them we just give them for first 6 months sir in uh, marginal ulcer so maybe you have uh, faced a patient intractable marginal ulcer no response to medication so what yeah. did it surgically so how you solve this the patient man that's why i lost all my hair uh, <laughs> so difficult to treat patients who come with this uh, chronic pain because yeah. of a mar- you give them everything uh, you try ppi you try uh, salazine you try everything whatever you got right you give them all those medications but at the end of the day uh, some of them will not heal yeah. uh, and i think first thing is you need to make sure that you look seriously about smoking as well as uh, non steroidals right once you've excluded that then to be honest with you it it becomes a difficult you keep on trying to manipulate different drugs to see if it works if it doesn't work and you've excluded a gastric gastric fistula so there isn't there then i think uh, you got very little options i have i have reversed some patients because of this right uh, and uh, it is it is a difficult option and then you can revise the operation but i think uh, i've ended up reversing them reverse the bypass completely reverse so in a normal anatomy yeah completely back to normal uh, this is the only way so yes i agree it's a very group i tell you uh, it's one of those groups which is uh, when you get them that's when you realize whether you were it was the right thing to do bariatric surgery or not i mean i agree, agree sir yes yes 100% agree yes they don't respond to any medication anything and this is the pain really they they this is uh, so uh, always patient is suffering with this and in my opinion this is a disaster 
also for the doctor also for the patient agree sir and challenging patients yeah also been gastroenterologist and yourself but that and you end up uh, doing something for them sir another issue that we also face and we are facing also here in dubai and also other words so that is the weight regain because overall all types of bariatric surgery they have at some stage weight regain till personally now i am facing weight regain after mini bypass because now my patient so they completed 10 years more than 10 years and now i am facing this such a situation but in ruan y because ruan y is a restrictive procedure uh, so definitely we face more so which percentage of your patient are suffering with weight regain uh imran i won't have exact number percentage wise but i think over the years there have been a fair number of patients who come back with weight regain uh because i said to you earlier that the way nhs practice runs that the patients come back to you because you in that area you are there so you see all your patients back when they got problems weight weight regain is a big problem in ruined by gastric bypass uh and uh, uh there is there are very few options to be honest with you i have tried banded gastric by i put the bands on them i've tried lengthening the alimentary limb i've tried lengthening the bp limb i've made the pouch smaller i've made new stomas tighter stomas second operation is never as good as the first one was yeah. right yeah uh, that is where i think when we treat so that's why my initial uh, when we're talking about when you treat super obese i think you need to be very careful they are never ever going to benefit with just one operation they might require another operation later on in life so do an operation from which you can offer them a second operation now with ru and by there are very few options left okay uh, people i think i've read literature about distalization and everything i don't think anything works there uh, my only feeling is that i think the best best operation which has worked for weight regain is lengthening uh, lengthening your bp limb mm. and that find that is the most effective a uh, way to do it uh, but then again if you were to lengthen the bp limb then you need to make sure you measure the rest of the bowel as well yes. uh, because you don't want to show a short bowel, bowel syndrome afterwards uh, so i think uh, it is it is an area where i'm sure the work is going to carry on and uh, the day, nowadays one of the advantages that we do is that we put patients on uh, uh, glps yeah uh, that has helped a lot Uh, so that's where Dr. Hartland is very helpful to me. That patients, when they come with the weight regain, the first thing is they go to him, and he will try medications first, injections on them to see if that works. If it doesn't, then we'll take them further from there onwards. But I think uh, of all the things I have done after doing by trying to for the weight regain, the most effective I found is the lengthening of the BP limb. Excellent, sir. Already you have mentioned this GLP one uh, derivatives. So someone, sometime uh, we face. patient you did standard ruan by gastric bypass everything was standard but then patient uh, lose weight but a stage stuck then so maybe 50 60% excess body weight loss and now stuck and patient is very and talking about this and nowadays so definitely the role of this glp1 derivatives and uh, definitely you are preferring to do this use for your patients yeah. i think that that's been a very useful uh, i uh, find that uh, the glp ones are very useful and i think that's where you need a team to look after these patients and i think it's very important that you need to prepare these patients uh, before surgery uh, to those who change their lifestyle they do very well afterwards it's the ones who think that the operation is going to do everything for them and they don't want to change their lifestyle they are the ones who are going to come back with the weight regain yeah definitely sir sometime patient is suffering with the dumping uh, so yes we know early and late dumping but they are suffering with early dumping but dumping is actually a uh, i would i would say it's a positive side of the procedure because with that at least these people give up uh, carbohydrates and come off uh, carbs which does help them with their long term weight loss uh, but in i actually it's very interesting uh, now i'll share a patient up uh, this is just about a couple of years ago we had to do uh this was a type 1 diabetic and was in a terrible state afterwards uh, 
lost weight and everything, did well, but then developed, suffered the dumping so badly that couldn't even go out. She couldn't even drive because uh, she used to get terrible uh, symptoms. So our endocrine teams, uh, they did everything. They studied it completely. They sent it back for us for reversal. We reversed the patient, but interestingly, symptoms have been gone. Yes. And now the other problem, in addition to the dumping, she's also got, uh, she's regained weight. Yeah. So she's come, she's saying, please, can I have the operation again? So we it can is- can do, it, sir, a sleep gastrectomy in such a case. We can change to a sleep gastrectomy. Is it possible? I think that's what I was thinking, that that might be the next option for her now. Yeah, we can go far asleep. Sir, uh, in, in your experience, now more than three decades, have you faced any mesidoblastosis? So that is a total different phenomena. Mesidoblastosis. That is not dumping. Mesidoblastosis. So this is hypoglycemia due to hypertrophy of beta cell. Uh, nope. I haven't, but must have been there, which hasn't come back to me. The patients haven't come back to me with it. Uh, such a situation never, because sometimes patients, they are normal and due to reaction of GLP-1, because rise of GLP-1 cause hypertrophy of uh, beta cell. If there is more production of insulin, so always patient is hypoglycemic. This is not dumping. This is mesidoblastosis. And that is also challenging for the patient, for the surgeon. And now again, they prefer to revise the surgery and it's better to go for a sleeve gastrectomy because then in a sleeve gastrectomy, yes, uh, the, all the process, because when we see this uh, GL, rise of GLP-1, the main cause is undigested nutrient when touch this L cell of uh, uh, terminal ileum and cause GLP-1 rise. And when we change to a sleeve gastrectomy, so okay, then there is no such a rise of GLP-1 as compared to any type of gastric bypass and definite progressively patient become better and better. Yeah. Yeah, sir, uh, sir, regarding, so in your experience, are you remember any, any, uh, uh, such a complication of Ruan Y that you cannot forget? This was disaster. If you want to share, like to share. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, I've seen all sorts of complications over the years and uh, dealt with them. Uh, in immediate post-op period is usually the worst one is the leak, basically, yeah. uh, which you were. And uh, I think uh, it's much easier to handle a leak in a ruined by gastric bypass than it is in a... Yeah. Ruined by is a low pressure system, so it's much easier for the view. Uh, other than that, uh, I think in the late complications, uh, offhand, uh, no, I can't, I can't think of something which is, was very striking and not in the literature, which I haven't seen. So why am I asking, sir? Because uh, oh, forever... Yeah, yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, sir. Sir, why am I asking this question? Because this must be a message from your side. Because if someone is going to start, especially our youngsters, if you are going to start uh, any type of bariatric surgery, you must be prepared for complication. And you must be ready. And you must know how you handle and if so, oh, yeah. it's very interesting. Recently, I've said a very interesting case. This was the case uh, came to us uh, from somewhere else. And this is a patient who had a ruined by gastric bypass and they had connected the wrong limbs. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. And the uh, interesting thing was that surgeon did realize because the patient was getting bile vomiting all the time, bile coming up. Yeah. And they went back in again, they tried to do it and they did the wrong, uh, didn't connect it properly again. So this patient then came to us, we actually reversed it uh, completely because she had lost so much weight and she looked terrible. So I just reversed it completely for her. And uh, that was an interesting complication of ruined by gastric bypass. That's why when I do my gastric bypass, I do my pouch first, then I bring a loop up yeah. to do anastomosis. And the last thing I divide is the uh, biliopancreatic uh, limb, uh, limb. Yes. And, limb and bring it down to do the anastomosis. In that way, I'm not reliant on putting uh, stitches or needles as markers on patient. Definitely, definitely. I think things can go wrong otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So this is important, sir. If someone is going to start, 
he must know and he must have this expertise a whole deal to such a complication and sir in your 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 opinion what is your main concern after ruan by gastric bypass i think uh, your main main if you divide that with an immediate period and a long term right immediate is your complications which can happen right and you, you i think most of us are very familiar with them like a leak or a bleed or those problems but in the long term one of the main complications you worry about is a hernia internal hernias but other than as more malnutrition and brain weight gain it is yes definite uh, sir uh, how you predict run my gastric bypass because if you see you are just just i am thinking about your journey when you have started this bariatric surgery open and that at that time this uh, gastroplasty and uh, vbg and gastric bending and now gastric bending is history and no one is doing this and now this the time so different type of surgeries like varanostomosis gastric bypass is going to popular it is easier more effective how you see this uh, ruan why so in future maybe after one decade maybe it will be only rescue operation or no it will be primary who and why will still stay for those patients who got reflux right and uh, it's 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 one of those and stay as you said that even after a mini or one anastomosis bypass patients who get bile reflux are going to end up being converted to ruan by uh, for them uh, so i i still see this because it has if see this is the only operation which is actually stood the test of time because uh, from 80s till now it is still there uh one form or the other and i think ru and why probably will stay in your armory for a long time yes that's my my own assessment because i still see if a patient comes to me and wants to ru and why to be honest with you i don't uh, discuss with them to change to any other procedure i'd go for it but if they don't want if want some other procedures i do have a discussion with them and try to convince them for the right operation because i think i think it's a safest operation which one could do i know technically it is more challenging than one anastomosis bypass because you avoid uh, jj anastomosis uh, but uh, from uh, it took the test of time it's worked so far very well over the years i think it's going to get it will be less because uh, since mini although mini bypass is also going on since 80s uh, rutledge was doing in 80s basically mini bypass at that time uh, but it's taken time for uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass and a mini gastric bypass to be recognized as a procedure of choice and uh, there are there are advantages i think we can learn from that and i think we can learn from every procedure and modify what we do and i'm i'm I've, as in my own practice now at present i think more than 30% are being having mini bypasses uh, because of the quality of life because they can eat better it is not a restrictive operation pouch size is bigger than what you do in a ruin by gastric bypass your anastomosis is wider than what you do in a ruin by gastric bypass because you're not relying on restriction you're relying more on uh, uh, malabsorption uh, so i think over you need to i believe one should have all procedures in their armatorium armatorium to make sure they can select the right operation for the right patient i don't think there's one operation for everyone no sir excellent so now yeah sir now in 2022 so this is a personal question which percentage of your bariatric cases are belongs to ruan by gastric bypass Uh, i would still say between about uh, 40% 35 35 to 40% is ruan why and then now because you have started mini gastric bypass and uh, this is also a, a political question are you happy your patients are happy uh i think as as long as you select the right patient and that's a discussion with the patient and yourself and you look at their quality of life because i think uh, i have like uh, uh before mini bypass i was doing my i think 80% patients were uh, ruined by bypass and 20% for sleeves but now sleeves have actually really gone down because sleeves are very much reserved now for super obese okay yes. 
does that think they're going to require a second operation? Whereas tests are all divided between Drew and Y and the mini bypass. Excellent, sir. Excellent. And really, it was, uh, in my opinion, one of the best questions. And so much thanks, sir, for your time. Uh, because we have a lot of youngsters. So any message for our youngsters who are just now going to start bariatric surgery or at initial stage of bariatric surgery? I think my request to them would be that it is a teamwork. You need a team to do, deliver this service. Don't start as a solo band. Don't think that it's a, just a technical challenge and you're going to get over it. You got to remember there's a patient at the end of it. And I think you need to work with the patient to change their lifestyle. You must make sure that you stay within your own expertise, right? Don't, there's one thing which I've always said to my trainees is that you got to work on a principle that you don't cause further harm. You, can, you can't cure everyone, but we can avoid harming patients. So metabolic surgery is not a solo or a single person's uh, field. You've got to have a proper team with you. You've got to train the team and the whole team got to be working in the same direction, right? And you've got to share with each other, right? It requires a long-term follow-up. Patients need to be prepared to change their lifestyle. Operation is a very small part of it. It's a follow-up, which is very important afterwards. Sir, so much thanks. And really, it is great honor. As viewers, you know, we have started this series of Rowan by Gastric Bypass with the legendary professor Himpan. And now today was our last session with another legendary professor, Amir Khan. And in, during this session, we had every week, uh, Tuesday, about six months, this was, uh, uh, I think, a marathon interviews with all of those who are expert in Ruan by Gastric Bypass. We will also have a sum up session about Ruan by Gastric Bypass. Our next uh, uh, interview series will be uh, this metabolic surgery in low BMI and definite that will be continued for six months. So my viewers, so my thanks. These all session, this interview series, all of our activities is due to your support. If you have any question, any query, any suggestion, you can contact personally myself. You can ask in comments and we will answer. Sir, again, so my thanks. And really, sir, uh, uh, I, this is the time I must uh, highlight this all uh, activities is due to your support, your guidance, and definite without your guidance, this was not possible. And hope uh, in the near future, we will be able to do more and more academic activities, and we will be able to start also our physical training programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. And thanks very much for people who are there jo who joined us to this program. But I think, yes, we this is the best way to learn, to be honest. I feel as uh, seniors with being now, the only the best service we can do is that help juniors and transfer our experience to them and help them to establish, to deliver the right quality of service to the patients. Sir, so much thanks and really appreciateable and hope to see you soon, sir. Thanks, Imran. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Have a nice time, sir. Thank you. Thank you.